we start. We start because we have a packed program. This is actually a very, very um, super interesting um, effort that we have worked on for a long time. But we would like to report a bit on um, a big new thing that we have done, funded by Nora, uh, is actually going uh, uh, back to the roots, as Jörn said in the opening or whenever, that we are really looking at back to the roots. So what are the concepts that has has helped us to be able to support, now I hear 88 countries, and my slide is 77, so this is growing so fast so we cannot even follow, um, ministries to scale up the DSS2 system. So this is actually rooting back to the Scandinavian tra tradition with, we call it participatory design, that we actually do co-creation together. But in be before the doing that, we also need to do a diagnosis together, which is actually the, the key element in the action research, that we do understand what, why are people not using the data? No need of putting all the data into a container if it's not getting out. That was, that's very much the first problems we saw that the, the data exists in national level. However, it's not available in the district level. District, that's why the D for the DHS2. But that you are, you are able then to, to analyze your situation and do intervention and understand what are, where are the, where are the challenges? What shall we do? So, when thinking of all this, reflecting back on the 30 years, last year, or before that one even, we were thinking, how can we share this to the global network? How can we um, do capacity building in the his groups, remembering where we're coming from, looking into what were the most, most important things? And that's why we started uh, an effort called, uh, a workshop called Information System, Re Information System Research Fundamentals having a workshop where we actually go through all the theoretical concepts that is needed in order to do a good diagnosis in the field, going from being only a TA uh, technical expert, but a digitalization partner. It's actually steaming a bit also from an evaluation we got that is important for them, the, the local his groups and the regional his group to sit on the table, to share experiences with the ministries. But then we also need to be looked at as more than an IT specialist, but a digitalization partner. Then you need to look at the whole picture. How can we do these digitalization processes? Um, this is at the root of our department informatics. Our research group is called Information Systems, and we are working on digitalization transformation processes. That is what it's all about. So then we were thinking, hmm, shouldn't we actually make it more explicit? Shouldn't we make it more train uh, ministries, train uh, his groups, so we can do more informed action research? Not only action, but to focus a bit on the research part, meaning always thinking about also discussing the diagnosis. What is actually the challenges here? How can we improve? What can we do? What not only technical but social technical, which we will hear a concept about, uh, which is a key in the information system digitalization processes and in participatory design and action research. Also, that we look systematically and holistic, that we're not only looking at one part, we don't not only look at the immunization register, we need to understand how the whole the mother and child health system is working, how it's connected to the whole HMIS. How is this connected to the rest, the holistic system? So the system thinking will also be a concept that we will share with you. And then we will share with you a particular uh, use cases uh, that has uh, taken place. We have had three IS research fundamentals. We had one in Kigali last September. So this is not that old thing. One week with all the his groups in Africa at that time. And then the whole his Rwanda, since it's in Kigali, and with the Minister of Health in Rwanda. Then we had one for Francophone countries in uh, Loma, Togo, uh, in December, with the, all the West African countries. How many countries were there there, Kofi? Huh? Seven. Seven countries, and everyone coming with a fieldwork study of the routine data use and challenges that they bring in 
to the workshop. And then we had one in Sri Lanka for the whole global team, uh, for all the his groups, all um, uh, the, the his groups were there. And we were sitting there for one week. Professor Rabindra was also there, <laughs> uh, together with the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Health and the whole his group in Sri Lanka. So that's how we work. We, whenever we are in a country, we capacitate widely in the country, however, bringing all the others in. And that was super interesting. It was kind of going to the next level, discussing how can we really help digitalization processes in countries. Not only plug the system in and run, and then leave people alone, uh, ending up that the data is not used, because we really see a challenge of the use of the data. So it's not like the only research we're doing is the uh, use of data. But however, that's actually the measure whether we have done it right if the data is usable for decisions. Otherwise, why should we put all those data and collect them into a container if they are not used? So that's why we are framing this as research on data use. But it's actually research on implementation, how to do it in a well way, and how can we capacitate people so they really engage with the data and understand the data. Uh, that's what we would like to share today. So I'm very happy then to give the word over to Jörn. <laughs> and then you can see that from the list, Jörn will then talk about um, all the experience from the last past 30 years. We don't go through all the years, I hope. But uh, uh, talking about engaging with the data. Then uh, Pamud will talk a bit about the concepts. And then Wilfred will talk about the district of excellence in um, for data use in Tanzania. And then Kofi will actually report on the West African um, studies that has been done, the data use studies, and see how that link to the concept that we have talked about. Okay? So over to you. Yeah. Hello, hello. Data use is a bit uh, complex uh, matter to do research on and also to uh, define very clearly because we have been talking about data use quite some time, but there's not, you, if you search for articles on data use, you don't really find many. So why and how? That's something we need to find out uh, together. I don't have all, <laughs> all the answer. I might not have many answers at all, but I want to talk about the research and the research on on data use, and I can also mention that uh, the WHO aligned HTC Health Data Collaborative is also trying to find out how. And we have a group uh, called the Routine Health Information System in the HTC, which is working on data use, and we try to find out how to make strategies for data use and how to spread these spread these strategies and ways to do data use uh, research around among the countries. So that's kind of what we have been been uh, discussing. But I want to have give you one example where uh, when we did uh, data use, uh, two examples. One, of course, was uh, in the very old days in, in, uh, in South Africa. The idea was to find out across the country whether the equity in health and health service provision was reached and then you needed indicators and you needed only the it was a chaos a lot of data but you needed them to focus on the minimal but essential indicators not much data too much data was there so that was one one example and i was thinking about that when we had a workshop in rwanda recently not this research workshop, but another we were uh, starting this climate health uh, project in Rwanda, and there were stakeholders from environment, from from the meteorological uh, departments, from all over, and they all had slides upon slides on data that they wanted to get included. And then I remembered what we found out in South Africa then 100 years earlier, that uh, only focus on the essential and important data, at least first. Then later you can add whatever you want, but essential data, minimum data sets. That was interesting that it was a key 
thing in South Africa 30 years ago, and it's a key thing when you try to do something on climate and health and environment and uh, these kind of complex matters today. Because there's so much data, we need to find our way through it. That's two examples. Another example was uh, we had a big uh, global fund uh, project uh, around 2014, 15, 16 in, uh, in, in uh, Indonesia, where we tried to, it was called da dashboards because data use and dashboards kind of were linked together. And what we did was to focus first on the routine uh, situations where data was used. And what we found was that in Indonesia, they had every month a data use meeting in all health facilities. They called it Lockmin. Okay, we focused on these routine data use meetings. And next step was data. You must make data avail available for this system. And then came this, uh, which is also, I mean, I put up some keywords there. <laughs> the digital and uh, can the digital and the data because one thing is to say that you need uh, the key indicators and the essential data etc cetera, etc cetera. what was the situation in in uh, indonesia was that all the different health programs they had their own system tb had their system uh, epi vaccination had their system uh, modern child health their own system and many of these systems were only in Excel and that kind of things. So integration was difficult. So what we did in this project, we had we had uh, two districts in in five different provinces, five different islands. So then we had to do the hard way, and that was to type in the integrated data and find what how to because some data was kind of uh, they used national databases where you, for example, for TB and HIV. You had national systems that were actually, it was possible to pull data out of. So you could integrate what was kind of very digitalized, but others like immunization, you had to type in yourself. So the two steps then, focus on, on uh, routine data use situations, fine, monthly meetings. Second, make data available that's a more difficult story and that's as important of course but that's so that is something where dhis and all these things uh, standards etc comes in so that's uh, two important uh, important uh, lessons when it comes to uh, come to data use and also if you go deeply into data use what is it what are the decisions and we have our friend uh, Arthur Haywood, who had been working on this for ages and made uh, already many years back a, a kind of a manual for how to use data for action. And he's always pestering us about key indicators, key targets for each health program, put up the targets, identify the indicators and follow them. And that was written many, many, many years ago. And I mean, it's a well-known principle. But still, it's not really uh, easy to see the results of all this kind of work on data use uh, so many years uh, after these kind of principles have been made very well available. And of course, that's because uh, data is, you don't really know how organizations are using data because there are a lot of research on why and how data is not used in organizations. There's more research on that than on actual positive results of data use. So, of course, maybe it is true that you, you only use, in organizations, you only use data uh, based on what is good for you. You show, ah, look here, I mean, uh, I have performed well. And you show that data, that show that you have performed well, rather than finding out how to <laughs> why you are not performing well, as an example. So that's it. And I've discussed a lot with uh, Arthur Haven about this, and he, he has put up a kind of a very normative framework for a district, for example, that you have monthly meetings or you have quarterly uh, kind of actionable points so that you divide into the 
health services, uh, like management, staffing, etc., etc., that kind of logistical systems, etc. You have indicators on that, one quarter. Next, you have the primary health care uh, coverage uh, programs like EPI, NC, etc., and have indicators on that. And then you have the diseases, follow up that. And you run through this as a kind of a way to install some routine practices. That's fine. So that's one, one way to come out of this. But the point here is how to do research on this. And uh, I put up uh, a couple of, uh, couple of things here, research. You need to publish. I mean, research is basically about coming up with ideas and documented ideas that you publish. So how to publish research on data use? That's a question that's important to look into. And now, for example, Wilfred will come up and tell us about his uh, district of excellence after. Then we can ask him, how are you publishing this? I know that because he asked me how it could do that. So, I mean, I know that that question is very relevant. <laughs> so, and how, how do you frame it? Because it's very easy to just list up what you find. I mean, through field work, you, you kind of come up with a lot of uh, findings. But uh, very often it's just, yeah, yeah, it's like that in the, out in the field. And we saw that, 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 and that. So it's important to come also to the next Point, and that is to understand what are the points, important things, try to conceptualize things. Why are they not using data? What we saw in, in Indonesia was, for example, that the data was not available across programs. They had good data in each program, but never across the programs. So that's one answer. So then we can address that, address that. And similar other, other kind of conceptual, uh, conceptual uh, issues. And how is this digital coming in? How, how is the information system uh, able to, to come up with something here? And then we have how to write uh, this research. And I can tell you we have a project in uh, Rwanda where we have listed up, I think it's uh, seven different topics that we want to do research on. Uh, one is uh, what we have discussed now, data use. And there they have a project. They also have a kind of a district of excellence where they, where they have uh, one particular uh, district where they, have, they are uh, focusing on these routine meetings. Also in Rwanda, they have routine meetings every month. So they are trying to come up with the indicators and data that are relevant for these meetings. And they also have uh, have another another uh, invention where they call, they call it race to the top, where each of the facilities, maybe thirty health centers in in the district in this district, they are trying to be the best in addressing a data data quality issues. I mean coverage and and things like that. And every month that they will have then a list of those who have performed best kind of a, a peer review way of, of looking at uh, at uh, at uh, how they are performing on the on the data in in the district so kind of a competition between the facilities that's a, another innovation that's interesting and uh, we have other other uh, projects one is uh, on the integration of CRVS and immunization because one big issue in immunization is to find out. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's not so important. Oh, yeah, OK, OK. Ah, yeah, I have something in the bucket here. <laughs> so yeah, OK, OK, OK. So that was the other, other that's also data use to find out. We use the data in order to find out where are the children not immunized. So that is a classic uh, uh, data use question, maybe a bit special because it's about yeah, analyzing the data more and having a concrete uh, issue that you want to investigate by using the data. And uh, another project in, in that we want to write up in, in Rwanda is to integrate an immunization and nutrition 
because what they found out uh, in uh, Rwanda was quite uh, clever because when a child is coming for immunization it's also way and then these uh, measure, measures are registered on the baby so that you have a register for all the children in in Rwanda and you can easily identify uh, that that is the idea then this is just all these are quite new new innovations so the idea is then that you can make a a map of Rwanda to find out where are the uh, ten percent uh, worst malnourished uh, districts. I mean, with babies, uh, with malnourished babies uh, district, and even facilities. So that's another data use example, which is about investigating the data and finding out how you can go about this. So the last question uh, I wanted to, to, to talk a bit about is uh, since we call it research. And research is basically about writing up. So, how do we write up these things? And that is where we have this um, this group uh, in in Rwanda. It's actually uh, people from the Minister of Health, from the different health programs, etc. There, we have different groups on different topics, and we haven't really solved all the problems of writing up yet. But at least we are in at this stage. We are at documenting all these kind of different things, having uh, uh, research questions, and then uh, writing it, and we have meetings every week and discuss these things, and next will, of course, be then to, to finalize this write-up and get it into some kind of format that uh, can be sent to a journal or conferences and things like that. And that is where many of these projects are stopping and it's, it's because it's a bit complex for I said what can I say normal people to to go the long way to actually publish things but uh, we try and uh, that is what we want to come uh, as an uh, advice to you guys also to go for publishing on on data but just one final comment why it's so difficult actually to find articles on successful data use stories maybe it's because it's maybe too much focus on 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 only finding out some kind of a rational way a district is run whereas the more uh investigative uh, examples like what i mentioned here about finding out who are not immunized uh, integrating nutrition and immunization to find out where the malnourished are etc it's kind of that kind of drilling down in the data maybe that is i will not say that it's easier but it's at least another way to come up with the published uh, or or cases that are good to publish so yes thank you thank you Just uh, thinking of the time timing, we have uh, a packed program. No, 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 no. Perfect, perfect. So these traditional hours to actually describe uh, lost again. Uh, traditional hours to actually do rich descriptions of practices in order for the practices to be inspired by others. That's kind of a tradition we are doing in the qualitative uh, research framework that we actually try to describe. Uh, also what's going on in the field to be engaged in the field because the solutions are very often in the field where it is possible to address the the, the aim as the target as Jorn was talking about Over here. okay so uh, good morning everyone I know that uh, we have 65 minutes approximately or even less uh, to cover four presentations and have uh, to have a Q&A so I will uh, straight away jump into this uh, presentation so now we know like uh, like what is data use and uh, what is the importance of conducting data use uh, in health information systems and the implementations that we are doing and uh, how to, I mean, we also have a little bit of idea about how to write and publish. So let's look at some of the concepts that we have discussed in this um, um, information systems research fundamental workshop that we have had all across the world. So, I mean, this is going to be a brief summary of one of uh, uh, key concept, which is on uh, so socio-technical approach. But I will also try to uh, briefly um, uh, touch upon this idea of systems thinking. Right. So the thing is, 
Now, we, when we try to implement information systems and digital systems, we tend to kind of overlook uh, uh, the idea of what is in, in, I mean, the holistic picture. Because uh, we are kind of provided with the TOR, uh, a set of activities that we need to do, and maybe a SRS requirements document, and we are, we are trying to develop a system. But what usually happens is when we try to implement systems, we implement it in a, in a situation or in a context where there are so many other things. So, for example, uh, if we try to implement a digital system in the Ministry of Health, they have their own routines, roles, practices, standards, policy, poli uh, policies, values, beliefs, things like that, which are more uh, social in nature. Right. So, what we try to emphasize is like when you are trying to implement systems, you you should not just take a technical or technological approach, but you need to consider the social aspect as well. Why it is important, let's discuss during this presentation. Okay, so let me straight away jump into one uh, example. So this is one of my personal experiences of uh, an implementation I was involved in Sri Lanka 10 years back. So the, the requirement was to design a system for tracking nutrition-related data, which is to be implemented at field level. Okay, so we got uh, all the, uh, uh, you know, like the requirements from ministry, ministry as in like not only from national level, there were stakeholders from different levels as well. They mentioned these are the different uh, data that we need to track and this is how we are going to implement uh, the system and this is how we are going to provide support. So everything that we generally require or a TOR kind of thing and followed by a couple of meetings, that all happened. And we were able to build a system uh, of course, like uh, what you are seeing here is, uh, I mean, this is related to nutrition and again, like the good doll tracker capture application. And of course, we did uh, trainings. We went to the field level and did trainings. We did all that. But something that uh, we did not actually realize uh, before we implement and we started getting feedback is where these systems are going to be implemented. So what you, uh, who you see here is a public health midwife who's a field health staff. And this is kind of uh, the working environment that she uh, lives every day, right? So she goes in the field, she crosses streams and rivers, and you have to uh, conduct uh, mobile clinics uh, in, in very tentative establishments. And that's where they are capturing data. And we are hoping they will also use data in this kind of a context. So what we really didn't see at some point of time when we were deciding is uh, designing the system where we are capturing the data i mean what is the device is it a mobile phone or laptop and then like will that have any implications of uh, how they are going to use data and um, for example like how uh, what's the role of training i mean like these are field health staff how are you going to conduct training across the country right will it be a one day training program will there be peer support from other uh, midwives or their supervisors and then again like whether there are any individual factors like what's the role of motivation of individual midwives and like what's the capacity is it same can we uh, kind of tailor made a program and expect that all the midwives will be equally uh, adhering to whatever the recommendations that we prescribe from a national level right and also uh, things like uh, other organizational practices like do they actually have guidelines right norms and for example review meetings that uh, christine mentioned before Right. I, I mean, are these things established? We did not realize that. Right. So the thing is, like, without all this and you just design a system and try to implement with trainings and user manuals and all that, there can be issues related to sustainability. So this is our learning. I mean, this was not formal research. This is what I learned afterwards. So that's why uh, we, we kind of emphasize this approach where like we don't just consider the technology aspects, right? This is related to the different user interfaces, performance, infrastructure, hardware, and things like that. These are very relevant. But in addition, you also need to consider things like work practices, roles, different policies, routines, which are there. I mean, they are different from country to country. That's why you can't just plug and play a system that you that is that works really well in one country and expect that same system will work at same capacity in another context because it has to be very contextual you have to think of the entire system system means not the digital system the system means like the socio technical environment ecosystem in the country right so uh, uh the thing is like uh, one other thing that we don't usually realize is 
whenever you try to um, inject something into a context it changes the context okay so what happens we think like we build technologies based on what is existing in organizations right so organizations has their practices it i mean of course it is socio technical and we implement a system and uh, i mean that's it but what we what we don't realize is when we inject or implement a system in a context it changes the context it changes the work practices and the beliefs and everything in that organization so it's not a yeah, very unidirectional thing where organizations determine what the technology will uh, will do and it will uh, it will adapt but uh, it also goes other way around where technology will reshape how the organization will perceive the information right how uh, they all will act as a whole that's what we don't tend to realize right when you implement a system uh, in a context in a ministry it will change what people think about the system what people think about the data and how they are going to use that data to improve or even it can go in negative directions it can uh, even trigger trade union actions right so all these things you have to consider whenever you implement a new technology so what is crucial we have opportunity here we have to adapt uh, uh, these technologies to organizational arrangements and we need to kind of rethink how we uh, uh, organize as an institute when we implement technology right just don't inject a system into a context always think when you implement a system what uh, what will be the end end result or how it is going to uh, affect the working practices in in a particular organization this you need to consider and this is about the socio technical approach few other things so let me highlight some problems that can happen so the thing is we think when we implement systems it will resolve lot of issues in organizations but what we have seen sometimes when you try to implement digital systems and people will complain we were better before now we have more problems more complications right and then they will perceive this as a kind of a burden so the thing is when you have a issue in the organization don't ever assume that when you inject a digital system it will resolve all your organizational issues right that will never happen and that will further complicate things and people will start resisting you resisting whatever the systems that you are going to build in future so that's a very bad thing so the thing is we see in a lot of countries you kind of try to mirror the existing paper flow paper forms and uh, data flows uh, in when you are deciding when you are designing digital systems that should not really be the way you should understand how we can optimize when we try to implement digital systems right so do not mirror so with all that our approach should be like uh, when we i mean of course we have a lot of learnings from the past and when we plan for the future as a hisp as hisp we have a lot of history in this uh, approach called participatory socio technical design approach right so in summary what we what i was trying to explain to you in last few minutes but i know like this is a very brief presentation but that's why we are encouraging all of you just connect with us connect with our broader research agenda we did some pilots last uh, last whole year as uh, christine mentioned with this uh, research fundamentals workshop but we can expand more involving all of you so again emphasizing don't mirror the existing systems and think how you can build capacity in countries that you are working in so uh, the approach will be more socio technical rather than just taking a technical approach in deciding in designing systems so to do that what is required this is my last slide um the first thing is the design approach right so rather than a technical technological approach always think how the design should be socio technical consider all the different social considerations in the context and then it's all about project management right so uh, uh, these are digitalization projects so uh, you need to kind of work with people not just work with technology so if you can manage people sometimes even with a not so optimal te technological solution you will be able to succeed as long as you can manage people it's all about people it's not about technology right so you can have a very basic technology uh, serving a lot of purpose if you can manage uh, the people and then the thing is the final thing i want to emphasize think of the broader system the holistic wave uh, because uh, don't think like when you inject a system 
uh, it will adapt to the uh, whatever previously there when you inject something it will change the context so think of it and be futuristic and have a holistic view so here what i was uh, trying to do in last almost 9 minutes um is to emphasize two things one thing is the importance of taking a socio technical approach that is core in our data use research uh, in hisp and then think of the broader system okay All right thank you very much Thanks. Um, so um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, an initiative in Tanzania called District of Excellency. Am I audible? Yeah, where we kind of um, establish an environment where we could test innovation, but as well as, you know, do some research and investigation and understand what works, why it's working, and for whom it's actually working. Um, this uh, project is something which we are doing, uh, his Tanzania, but uh, with the uh, University of Oslo, uh, but also with the Minister of Health uh, in Tanzania with the local government. So what is a district of excellence? I'll go a little bit fast on the few initial slides, uh, kind of uh, motivating why what is a district of excellence. As I said, this is kind of a, a test bed environment for kind of testing innovations, uh, but also approaches in terms of what, why it works, why uh, it doesn't work as well and for whom it works. So we, are, we thought about this kind of an initiative where we could really work with the local government and also sub-national level to really test some of these innovation, but also to do some research and specifically on data use and see, of course, we always say that there is a lack of data use at the country, but that, is it really? We need to kind of go there and investigate and say that, are there practices for data use? If there are, are they sufficient enough? You know, what can we do to improve those practices of data use at the local level? So this is kind of part of the uh, larger history action research effort where we kind of go to the field, work with the local people, come up with the interventions, test these interventions, and then, of course, later on, uh, see how we can document, as uh, <laughs> uh, Jan said, and, of course, uh, disseminate it as well. So this kind of um, a project is... Um, uh, ...working in Tanzania, in uh, the Doma region. The Doma region is our capital city. In the middle of Tanzania there, and we are working with two districts, um, Bahi District Council and uh, the Doma Municipal uh, Council, City Council, the Doma City Council. So these kind of two districts provide a little bit of a two different settings. One is kind of uh, urban, and then of course the other one is uh, a rural uh, area. So our methodology in terms of deploying um, a district of excellence is kind of looking at it in four legs. That is one is more or less we need to kind of investigate uh, and understand better uh, data management and information use practices, uh, see how we can come up with intervention, participatory with the local uh, people and see how we can inform and of course enhance that analysis and information use, but also kind of test some of the digital innovations uh, which we are developing. East Tanzania has been kind of developing uh, multiple uh, 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 kind of uh, application, but also the HISP network as well. So how can we bring this innovation back to the uh, or back to the subnational level and see how we can test them and see how we can improve them? But of course, the third leg is more or less on capacity building. Uh, we understand that um, subnational level, um, maybe the capacity of that analysis you use is quite limited. So thinking in terms of how we can build the capacity, but also the fourth leg is how can we do research and documentation? I think that is more or less a key point uh, which we are uh, looking on. To, to really start with this uh, DOE, we started with the baseline assessment, kind of understand, okay, what is there so far uh, in these particular two districts? Uh, both uh, understand the formal and formal, uh, you know, um, practices in terms of data use and see what are the gaps and how can we fill these particular gaps and come up with a work plan, which uh, we kind of develop it together with this particular two district in terms of uh, improving the uh, data use and dissemination. So all these processes has been more or less uh, participatory in terms of coming up with the interventions to improve um, our data use, uh, engaging the local stakeholders and formulating this uh, uh, intervention. But of course, the key important part is that we want to build on top of existing practices. Uh, we don't want to kind of come up with the new interventions which are kind of silos to what they have been kind of working on. So kind of uh, that was uh, a little bit of one of our approach in terms of uh, uh, moving forward. So there's a uh, uh, full documentation which we wrote in terms of our baseline uh, our findings. We kind of uh, um, did it in three areas, kind of look at the data management at these facilities and district, 
uh, their capacity in terms of data analysis and presentation, but also information use culture in this particular tool, to particular site. And of course, uh, some of the our um, sort of analysis which we have done. Um, um, I think you will kind of read a little bit more. We, uh, we have kind of uh, printed some of our reports here to kind of have a little bit of time of going through that. So what kind of interventions do we do now uh, in this particular two district of excellence? The first one, um, and I think this is linking back to what uh, Jon said in terms of coming up with uh, essential indicators. So one thing is we saw there were a lot of indi indicators within the system and the district and subnational level are, are kind of informed that you need to kind of run the, all this report, but we needed to sit down with them and understand, okay, what are the key indicators which you really want to monitor uh, and check the performance of health services within your facilities and within your uh, uh, district. And we come up with just 17 key indicators which they really want to monitor them uh, on the monthly base um, uh, and look at about the performance of the uh, uh, these health services delivery, but also kind of informing them what needs to be done, of course, uh, based on this uh, performance of those particular indicators. So that was kind of a one key stage which we kind of started Let's think of just a small set of indicators so that we can work on that. The second part was now um, to formulate these uh, dashboard, health facility and district dashboards, um, to really kind of now disseminate. Uh, we have these key indicators, uh, which you will be kind of monitoring in the monthly base. So how can you now disseminate that to the district level, but also to the facility level? So we develop this dashboard, DOA dashboard, or sometimes we call it a district and health facility dashboard, uh, which was now kind of, uh, and this is something which we did together with the district and facility people, identify the visualization part, identify the, as I said, the indicator, but identify how they are going to be using this. And this is something which the views in their data quarterly data review uh, meeting. One of the key things which I needed to also point out in terms of uh, developing this uh, facility uh, dashboard was that we needed also to develop a target population for health facility. Uh, ideally, that uh, we usually have population target population up to the district level, uh, facility level. They actually lack this particular uh, uh, data. So, uh, for for us to really kind of um, uh, formulate these indicators, we actually had to work with the uh, uh, district and also the facility to come up with the uh, target population um, uh, um, uh, data. Uh, it's also kind of a uh, a little bit of a side stream work, which we're also documenting to actually share our kind of our practices, our learnings through that particular process, because it was a little bit challenging. You actually have a 2020, 2022 sensor data, which had a projection up to 2024, but the ministry are not really comfortable with that particular sensor. They wanted the 20, 2002 sensor, which had been projected up to 2024, to be used as the standard base of how do you formulate these uh, health facility target population? But then again, we also had a problem that um, Tanzania, the, I mean, the ministry, or I would say the government has shifted uh, uh, the offices from Dar es Salaam to Dodoma. So there was a huge population uh, input within Dodoma, and that changed all that uh, landscape in terms of how do you develop this particular target population for this health facility. So there was a lot of kind of um, um, tensions and how do you negotiate through that particular processes. And then, of course, the other interventions we did, capacity building, and then capacity building, we did it in two levels. One is kind of these formal trainings, which we kind of conducted. We have, uh, for the last one year and a half, conducted two trainings, uh, sessions of uh, 70 participants uh, coming from district and health facility, coming together, learning on data, uh, data analysis, data use, data dissemination, using DHS2 to really understand, and of course, using the analytical framework, which I kind of uh, shared, but also uh, on-job training. Uh, we actually have a DOE a coordinator uh, based in Dodoma. He actually, on the monthly base, goes to this district and health facility to kind of conduct this uh, mentorship program. Before we said it's a supervision, but uh, we thought that there, he's not really supervising them, but more or less kind of cultivating that culture of data use. So it's a mentorship program to really sit down with them, uh, 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 understand what are the data quality issues, but also uh, impacting them, the knowledge of uh, data, data analysis. One of the key things, uh, is that during that particular process, we also saw that we were developing other mentors within those particular districts. Uh, for example, in one of the hospitals in the Doma Manispo, uh, one data manager was a little bit more equipped with this particular uh, skill set of data analysis, and 
she actually had to work around with our coordinator to other facility to train other people. So that was kind of, a, you know, creating this cascading ap approach of mentorship uh, uh, um, intervention. Then, of course, we have been doing also research. Uh, we have um, been engaging researchers and postgraduate students from uh, universities, locally, University of Dar es Salaam, but also International University of Oslo. We've been having a master student, uh, but also PhD students coming in and researchers coming in, uh, doing field work, uh, uh, investigating in different kind of uh, subset of uh, interventions, but also uh, kind of feeding in their research work within the DOE structure. Uh, we have also internally kind of come up with a study area to kind of see that what can we do uh, while we're working on this implementation, what can we really study? And we thought that as we, as far as we're talking about data analysis, data use, and et cetera, we need to take a one step back and look about to create a study on data quality. And we've been, uh, for the past three months, working on a, uh, a study, um, kind of really dig down within the data, uh, data which has been reported, understanding the quality and why this particular quality. Uh, there are some gaps within the, the, the data. This is one of the examples uh, of um, um, some of the uh, findings which uh, we kind of admit during our uh, investigation for data quality. Uh, that is, while people are reporting in DHS2, you're saying that we have a high completeness rate, uh, but this completeness rate is more or less on you know, completeness of that submission of the form. But if you really go down to the data, there's a lot of data quality issues uh, which needs to be addressed. A good example is that uh, we kind of run some uh, analysis and we found that, you know, this is kind of an OPD attendance where you actually have a lot of gaps within the health facility, you know, uh, in several months. And we, we expect uh, as a health facility, OPD should be kind of uh, a key intervention which we are providing. So if you are reporting, uh, you have service or provide a service for 20 people in this month and then for the next three, four months, you have not reported any OPD attendance, but you have reported also other information that was kind of a little bit of a, uh, a red flag which we kind of followed up with the uh, facility. We are doing also not only for OPD but also for other health services to kind of really understand uh, the data quality aspect and, and really now from that learning also to one publish but also to give feedback to the district and facility and how we can they can improve um, um, on, on their on, on the reporting. So what have we found so far? Uh, several learnings, but I just compiled them in a few uh, bullets here. Uh, what we have tried to do in implementing DOE is to engage the local government and the ministry so that they can be uh, spearheading the process. And this has helped us in terms of you know, them owning the project, but also uh, being part of that. So there's a lot of these interventions which we come, with, come up with, for example, this district uh, dashboard facility, dash, uh, health facility dashboard, uh, these studies and they are kind of welcoming and also acting on some of the recommendations which we are providing. Uh, tailor training, uh, this is also something which is important. Uh, we had to kind of uh, adjust ourselves in terms of providing training specific for health facility. The need of health facility is much different from the need of national level. So that kind of um, dynamics in terms of how do you really focus and customize the training for these health facility people so that you can, they can form um, their decision-making process is quite important. Uh, of course, uh, what we've learned, of course, is these uh, interventions such as dashboard, uh, scorecard, these are kind of uh, something which uh, facilitate more discussion and, uh, of course, inform also local, local actions. I think there's importance to really customize specific dashboard for these uh, health facility and district. Uh, local champions, that's also something which is really important. Like, uh, you really need to kind of see how you can develop a uh, cultivate these local champions so that they can be kind of the extended uh, data, data, data analysis or data use experts within their uh, particular area. And of course, uh, documentation, uh, this is also something which we see because as we have been working, we have been documenting, and I think uh, some of the documentations here is not kind of a published paper, but of course, that's a one step in terms of going through uh, towards that uh, um, process. Now, uh, we have a, a user story uh, because, as I said, uh, we always say that there's lack of data use, but uh, we need, first of all, to understand uh, what are the existing processes. And when we were doing this uh, study within the DOE, we uh, kind of came about this uh, kind of a good user story, which we thought to share with you guys. 
Uh, this is coming from a locality dispensary. This is kind of a very small dispensary uh, in uh, rural uh, Dodoma uh, Bahi uh, District Council. And uh, this particular facility has been reporting uh, very high malaria cases uh, throughout the number of years. And, 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 and as you can see, I'm not so sure if you can see, it's, it's the one which are, are very high numbers while you actually have hospitals in, uh, 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 in health centers in the particular Dodoma were reporting less, less, less number. So during these data review meetings, it was kind of coming up why you as locality dispenser are having a lot of malaria cases while other facilities are not having malaria cases. And the malaria coordinator kind of, you know, um, picked this up during these data review meetings because everyone was presenting their data. And then, of course, they kind of followed up. And one, one, one thing they noticed was um, there were some swamps uh, do it near that particular area, which kind of facilitates um, a mosquito kind of, um, 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 I would say, breeding grounds for mosquito. So this is something uh, we went to the field. Uh, we tried a little bit to kind of uh, um, do some interviews with the health facility in charge, but also with the malaria, the malaria coordinators, the lady on the right. Uh, and they were saying that during that particular swamp, there are also some kettles who are coming and eat and drinking the water. And as they stand within the water, they create kind of a small uh, 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 kind of water bubbles where there is where the mosquitoes are breeding. And then, of course, uh, everything happens uh, quite fast. Yeah, after understanding this, they've been trying also now to do some interventions, both uh, in terms of making sure they are um, uh, spraying, but also uh, making sure they're increasing the tests, uh, community tests. As you can see, the tests are going up. But of course, for the last uh, one or two years, the uh, malaria cases are also going down. One thing which the facility people kind of really noticed and, and say that, you know, this happened uh, uh, at the district level where um, they were comparing this data from different sites. But if we could actually have access to the system, then we could actually pinpoint these things earlier instead of waiting uh, until we are meeting uh, in the data review meeting. So that kind of gives us a sense that we really need to digitalize uh, this data, even data management, data analysis, data use to the facility level and not really uh, ending at the um, um, district uh, level. So what is our plan forward? Uh, very quickly, uh, push forward with the dashboard and analytical tools. Uh, we're also focusing on terms of how can we get some uh, digital tools, for example, tablets for a couple of facilities where they could really now start doing the data management analysis and use at the facility level to improve the data analysis. In, uh, uh, provide, of course, more support supervision, mentorship program, uh, program, research studies. As I said, we are doing the data quality, but of course, there are also other uh, uh, studies on the pipeline, but of course, uh, engage on these regular data forums because we see these are kind of local uh, interventions for data use. So how can we leverage on those particular um, 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 interventions? Asante Sam, and I hope I've not taken you in your time. Uh, please, you can uh, always, uh, we have some couple of uh, uh, reports uh, or at least documents uh, which we've printed. You could actually come and take a look at it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wilfred. Uh... Okay. So while coffee is setting up, maybe a question for, for Wilfred, if there are any, or we keep it for the, for the last session, where this last uh, Q&A session. No questions? Very interesting story, Wilfred, <laughs> to be continued. File owner crashed. <laughs> so coffee. Hello, can you hear me? <clears throat> okay. Okay. I would like to continue the series by sharing with you the experience that we did in Western Central Africa uh, using data field work. Oops. Keyboard. Okay. Okay. Uh, the the, the um, a few uh, outlines uh, and background. Uh, what we did as part of this data use uh, whole experience 
was uh, a field work that we did as a preparation to the meeting that happened in Lome. That meeting have seven countries, as uh, we were saying, and we have uh, Central African Republic, Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea, Togo, and so on. So as part of this uh, uh, data work, they went to the field, collected some data, and then reflected on this. I would say that um, what they do, uh, what they did is uh, to complete some observation. They observed uh, periodical health district uh, monitoring uh, and coordination meetings. They also, uh, at, in Mali uh, specifically, they were uh, they were having the opportunity to observe a regional uh, monitoring uh, meeting and coordination meeting where they uh, uh, that was uh, three days long, and then they have to discuss uh, data quality, health performance, and so on and so forth. Uh, Central African Republic brought a national perspective on the whole thing and they shared their experience on the journey along implementation of DHS2 and using it uh, for country health performance. So they also did some uh, interviews to see what the people think about the system, how they use it, how they understand it, what are the barriers the understand, uh, the, the, and the challenges that they are facing. So they interviewed basically the, the, the district management officers, also the program officers, both at the, the HMIS level, but also various programs like immunization, surveillance, malaria, uh, API, and so on. So in those, these interviews, they were sharing the challenges that they have. They also share the information of interest, the one that they use. Uh, and we were surprised to see that not, uh, not all, all the time what we think that they use are not what they really use. Uh, and I will come back to these later. They made some su suggestions to how we can improve the whole system. So a few sentences of what we, we found. The strength, first of all, all of these meetings were well structured. They had a clear timetable and uh, they know what to do first and then next and so on. Some of them were having some TORs, including the, the presentation of the recommendations. So they, they have some tools they use to track the recommendations from the previous meetings and see if they have been enforced, what are the challenges, what are, are the level of implementation of these recommendations. They also track uh, systematically, I would say, uh, completeness and timeliness. This is something that I would say that is more or less institutionalized in all these districts and all these places where we went, and they will track it uh, facility per facility. And sometimes they will directly challenge the facility manager in front of everyone to see, to check why are you that weak? You have this color code that everyone, uh, no, no one wants to be in the red, and it's a kind of incentive for them to make sure that they are uh, complete or they are on track. They also use a uh, scorecard. Scorecard is something that is very popular, especially for uh, API, but now growing in other sectors. I'll, as you say, they will track all these coverage and so on. So these are the strengths that we have found out there. Uh, some, uh, a few photos of what we, we did in the field uh, with these people. And this is a, a kind of uh, synthesis of the whole uh, strength that we have found uh, throughout this field work. But there are some also some challenges. The first of these challenges was the fact that they were extracting data from DHS2 to, to go elsewhere for analysis. They will use Power BI, some of them that are very advanced will use R or Python or, or simply Excel. So the question is why are they not using DHS2 analytics to perform their analysis and they are extracting the data right from the HS2 to, to other uh, tools to analyze the data. These are the questions that are prompted out, out of our researchers. The also, they, they, they don't have uh, advanced analysis ca capacities, be it in DHS or elsewhere. They will perform uh, coverage analysis uh, all the time, but root cause analysis, for example, bottleneck analysis are something that are lacking 
in there. Uh, I've talked about the parallel data sources that is uh, putting a, a burden of data work on these per, uh, people at, in, in the field, and this is a challenge we need to also take. Um, we we had uh, from the interviews harnesses some uh, some um, I would say suggestions from them. For example, reducing the data work that they are having, uh, capacity building. We have seen that a lot of these people that are currently at the district level or at the regional level, let's say at the sub-national level, these people are uh, using DHIS to undergo. The, these people, the people that have been trained has been replaced. And there are a lot of people that are out there that are using people on day to day, but has not had formal training. They also have... Um, a need of coaching. Once you have been trained, and then you go back to your field and you start using DHS, you find a, a, a difficulty. You are likely to just abandon DHS two and go back to your Excel. But if you have a coach or a mentor, somebody that is uh, senior that you can turn to and then can help you through it once, twice, then you gain the habit and then you become a DHS two familiar. SOPs. Uh, Pamo was talking about them. Most of the time, you have seen that. The SOPs are sitting at the district level. They are not down into the in the facilities or in the facility. They are in a wardrobe somewhere, and then nobody is using them. So we have been thinking about how we can make guidelines uh, uh, approaching more people uh, uh, in the field. So from these findings, we have started trying to reflect, and that way I'm going to challenge your your mind a bit, and in theories. So we are trying to use some theories to understand why these things are happening. So for example, uh, a theory that can be used, for example, to understand is the institutional logics. Institutional logics is a theory that th uh, talks about how institutions work, how their practices, their beliefs can uh, kind of I either be an enabler or a barrier to the adoption or the sustain uh, sustainability of something. So uh, these are something that we are trying to use to understand. We also uh, turning to affordance theory, which is talking about how people that are informed uh, of something can have uh, an interaction with DHS2 or other things. So these are the theories that we are trying, and there are more theories. So. I will be happy to see if you are familiar of you for using theory to understand what is happening on the field. That's what is about research. Over. Object as well as Hamoud is also and um and the Wilfred is finished long time ago. Long time ago. Okay, so we are towards the end. Uh, please uh, write up your question. Q and A will start after Pamut's uh, last um, presentation about the um, data use in Sri Lanka. Here in the right way, right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. So, uh, yeah, following uh, institutional logics and affordances theory, back to uh, socio technical. Right, so uh, what I'm going to briefly present is uh, uh, what we did in Sri Lanka together with the uh, Ministry of Health. So all what I'm presenting is uh, totally owned by the Ministry of Health and um, the am amazing work they have done so far. So this is what we have observed related to maternal and child health data use in Sri Lanka. Right, so a brief overview of Sri Lanka. I mean, in summary, we are an island nation. But of course, with like a lot of diff difficult terrain in some part of the country, a uh, small population of uh, relatively small population of 22 million. And we have a, a free um, health and education care uh, provided to every uh, all the citizens at point of care. Right. 
Okay, specifically uh, focusing on the health sector because the I mean it's very important to understand how the health sector is structured when it comes to data collection and management in Sri Lanka. So as I mentioned, it's a uh, 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 it's predominantly all I mean the healthcare services are predominantly provided by government under a free healthcare uh, system. And what you see on your right is how the country's uh, health sector hierarchy as well as information hierarchy has been structured in a very simplistic way. So basically, we have the ministry at the top, and at grassroots level, uh, 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 the person who will be uh, the key one, key person who's uh, um, contributing to most of the story is the public health midwife. And then we also have this person called medical officer of health. It's kind of equivalent to a sub district level. So our story is based around those levels uh, predominantly. Okay, right. So uh, maternal and child health information system. There has been a very strong paper-based system in the country, full stop, right? So I'm, I'm giving due credit to that system because, because of this only we were able to build a digital system on top of it, right? If, if, did, if this did not exist, most of what I'm going to present would not have been achievable. So um, uh, uh, with that, of course, there were uh, monitoring and evaluation practices, supervision practices, which were already in place. And the digital system was introduced in around 2007. So again, the hierarchy on your left, and this is how the data is collected. So basically, the uh, aggregate data, I'm talking about aggregate data, not at individual level, aggregate data collected at uh, grassroots level by the midwife, and uh, it is digitalized at the sub-district level, and then uh, uh, it goes up, right? All right. So. If you had a very uh, nicely working paper-based system, why did you need a digital system? So we don't break things, right? So if something works fine, we just keep it. The reason being, as you can see here, again, uh, some photos taken during our field visit uh, on this data use research. You see how many number of uh, papers, and of course, uh, sometimes uh, uh, it's easier for them, I mean, some feedback from the end users to capture data at uh, using mobile devices. That was their own feedback. And then, of course, um, we can, you know, like do a lot of data quality checks on data, which is not possible if you had the only paper-based system, like things like validation rules. And of course, you can analyze data and nicely visualize them as dashboards. So, I mean, it could be tables, so charts, even maps. So there are like a lot of advantages and that's why they adopted. Right, now let's, add the, let's look at the team. Most important person is the grassroots level health worker who you see here, uh, the public health midwife. Of course, uh, she has her own office at uh, some small center uh, in the field. And uh, this is uh, what you see from her office. And this is the champion team who's working at sub-district level. Okay. So this guy, but, uh, the person that you're seeing here is a public health medical doctor. So he's kind of like the manager and the key technical expert at sub-district level. And this is a supervising officer of that public health midwife. We call a public health nursing sister, and he's the public health inspector. I mean, having a uniform which is very close to police sometimes, but uh, <laughs> because uh, he's very powerful when it comes to food inspection and you know, like things, slaughterhouse house inspections and things like that. And of course, we have the data officer, all at sub district level. And this is the district team. So as you can see, you have the one person into your left uh, who's the matron, as we call it, like the supervising officers of the nursing sisters in that blue uniform. And we also have a public health specialist uh, here. And then of course, uh, 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 this one is again a kind of, a, I mean, we call it a consultant, but he's, uh, she has more experience than uh, the basic uh, uh, public health doctor. Right, oops, okay, Oop. all right, yeah. So let's see what happens at facility level when it comes to data. So there is something called once a month data review meeting, which happens at sub-district level. And this photo was taken when we uh, did this field study. What they do is they will do a lot of things. They don't have this meeting just for DHIS2 or data, right? This is, I mean, time is precious. This is for so many other things. This is where they meet all the field health staff and discuss with multi-sector people, like school representatives will come, police will come, you know, like they will share the issues. But the data review also happens as part of it. And uh, all the facility staff will be there. In addition, from district level, one or two persons will also attend. So under district level, if you have 10 sub-districts, they will divide the days in the month where, uh, when they are holding it. So district level people can uh, participate. So there will be review activities as well. In addition, this one, 
is we call name is a bit uh, misleading if you just are uh, not familiar with uh, the context we call it national mch review but this is a once a year activity which happens at district level where the national level mch people will come right and they will look at data and all the district and sub district level people will have to be accountable there will be discussions of course there will be data to action which is very targeted towards that district again what i have talked about so far is something that existed before dhs2 era very important fine so um uh, just some highlights of different uh, data that is uh, collected i'm not going into detail because this is very technical mch data, uh, data right now we talk about the digital system so once this system was introduced in 2017 dhs2 uh this is uh, what you see like the dashboard so basically what they did they had some existing things that they are supposed to monitor at sub district and district level to make things easy they created dashboards uh, reflecting the existing supervision indicators and because you can't really before before a question a question is asked from the audience why you don't use dhs to dashboards for review due to you know internet and things like that they pre what they did was they prefer uh, they they prepared a set of slides in a powerpoint and all these slides are addressing some key indicators they want to monitor and uh, those slides reflect the dashboards so whatever you have in the dashboards are there in the slides and the sub district level they were supposed to uh, prepare this uh, uh, slide deck in preparation for that annual activity right so there will be like lot of preparatory work that happens uh, data review and uh, final uh, uh, powerpoint slide prefer preparation before we have this annual data review right so what you are seeing here are some of these slides right the resilience so what happened this was before van pandemic this dhs2 dashboards and all during the pandemic the national people could not travel to districts okay so due to that all these activities were conducted started to be conducting online so all these districts like 25 district activities they scheduled uh, across 3 months and they had it online and this is an activity which is continued up to date and uh, in a, in a online in uh, like of course on site is much better but it's kind of like a hybrid thing so this is some uh, a meeting which i also joined as part of this review process very recently but uh, this is continuing so this is like uh, showing the resilience so you have something and and you have a shock and you kind of build on what you already had and this is how the review meetings are currently taking place and in addition there is something very local these are whatsapp groups and you if you can even see these they have gone into the extent these discussions will also include some research articles you see there's something from biomed central so people are sharing research articles arguing okay someone uh, comes up with the interpretation and they say no it's not like this so you we have this is something very local at sub district level we see right in addition there will be supervisions i mean mch reviews and things like that okay success factors yeah so very important if you go through the list uh number 3 is about technology right but everything else is not so much about technology so i just want to um, kind of emphasize the fact about socio part so you need to have a well established paper form and governance in place before you try to implement a digital system or before or i mean you have to do it in parallel if you don't have proper governance and you implement a system don't expect data use you can with lot of push from national level i mean with so much of money and all you may be able to implement but it will not sustain and people will not like the system because it has to be beneficial for them uh, uh, aligning with the existing uh, governance and of course ownership so ministry owns it i mean we have minimal say in dhs2 system we just there are there for what capacity building and expert support when they can't manage it that's it as the hisp we are not implementing dhs2 systems in our uh, in sri lanka because the ministry has their own capacity and of course um, we have scheduled review activities at all levels and peer to peer learning so learning is not something that we can you know like establish in a formal manner you have to make sure that at grassroots level there will be champions there will be midwives who know better than others and they should be able to share the uh, share their experiences and guide others right so this peer learning this informal learning also plays a crucial part in this whole process of course areas for improvement there are many 
uh, although there is some data to action, they won't more follow up. And then there are gaps. And uh, 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 of course, there are discussions around how to capture individual level data and how we can, you know, like deal with data use at individual level, which is a bit challenging. Aggregate is easy. So that's why even though they have capacity, they are being a bit careful, not too ambitious, which is a bit, uh, bit strange to me. I see it in many other countries where they are very ambitious, but at least this program is uh, taking baby steps. Uh, because they, I, I, I mean, my interpretation, because they had a robust system to start with. That's why they are being more careful and uh, being a bit cautious. So with that, I will take questions later. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, now, yes. I have 10 minutes, yes. Because um, I'm very interested in these practices of uh, uh, digital uh, ready meetings during the pandemic, and you also mentioned the economic crisis later. That also called for you know a bit of intervention, innovations when it comes to saving money and stuff, yep. transport and everything. Can you can you just talk a bit about that kind of? Because I think it's interesting because it's um, better to have uh, digital ready meetings that not having meetings because we. During all this, I think we have been through maybe 20 countries or something through our IS fundamental um, research data use research studies. Many don't have money or only do review meetings when there is financing. So I really want to hear more about the digital one because that's much better than not having, even though physical meetings are nice, but uh, not having is not so nice. Huh? So you can reflect it. Yes. So, uh, first of all, these review meetings were not donor-driven activities even before pandemic. So, that's the important thing. So, government should have some sustainable mechanism to conduct review meetings and not be driven by donor interest. So, that was crucial. So, given that there was a scheduled agenda driven by the government, government money was utilized to conduct review meetings, which was sustainable. And we had the shock of pandemic. So then again, like they all, because it was a planned activity, there was government budget. It was a mandatory activity for them to keep track of everything. So the idea came from them. We need a mechanism how to do that. They kind of foresee, I mean, it was planned at some moment in a couple of years time to go in fully digital, but this was already in place and they had the dashboard. So they decided, uh, it's just that you, I mean, the, all the machinery was already there. Right? That was very crucial. That's why I was talking about governance and uh, uh, capacity and decision making. But the challenge was how to get, uh, you know, infrastructure and things organized at sub-district uh, level. So there, but again, because the existing governance was already there, it was quite easy uh, for them to organize this. But um, like, I mean, few other things. So basically like to answer to your specific question, you need to have some prerequisites. So based on that only you respond when you have that so when you get a kind of a shock so you have all these things in place and then it's a matter of decision making and communicating that we have to continue our uh, uh, monitoring process and then they had whatsapp groups and all these things to communicate disseminate information they scheduled it and national team joined online district team also with some participants from sub-district level and it was a, a couple of day, hours of activity which was done online. So they presented this PowerPoint uh, thing and then there were like feedback questions back to back. Uh, so it's still happening. And then we, as you mentioned, we had this uh, economic crisis. So back to back shocks. So showing resilience. I mean, also reflecting some of my PhD work on resilience. So uh, yeah, not sure there's something like that. Uh, any questions, people? We can have one over there. No, somebody have to run. Yeah. Oh. So we'll freeze one. Then we need one more, my like guess. Oh, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, Patrick Comiel is my name. Yeah, so for Uganda, we equally did the same. Uh, sorry, we didn't have the opportunity to present, uh, but uh, we basically uh, did document the uh, the subnational uh, review meetings that uh, was happening in Uganda, and uh, we're able to share. But uh, I'm here with my the Minister of Health so I was asking me why are we not presented. Yeah, but uh, the question I wanted to ask you. <laughs> yeah, but the question I wanted to ask you, you know, being on the side of the implementation, uh, most times when you come up with 
recommendations. I think there's expectation that you should be able to, to act on those recommendations. So, so I don't know how the XPI experience has been. Like a simple one of, you know, if there are no SOPs saying data quality, being people who support implementation, uh, there's some kind of expectation that you should be able to work and support that. I, I don't know how your experience has been with some of these recommendations that we uh, and that will come that will come up within the process of you know documenting uh, this. So yeah, um, as you kind of go through these uh, implementation and kind of um, understand what are the gaps. I think there are several gaps, and I think uh, you might need to first of all to see what are the low hanging fruits which you could actually implement, and then show the impact of, of your work to the government, but also to the local um, data manager so that they can always create that momentum to, to, to move forward. But I think um, as, as, as an example, what you said, if there is a lack of uh, SOP, for example, lack of, there's a gap somewhere. I think one of the key thing which we've learned is that it's not really taking the authority and say, we are going to do this, but you need to kind of work together with the um, the people there and say that, can we try to do this? Can we work? Of course, there are some expectations, there are some costs, and I think that is something which you might need to discuss and kind of motivate for them to see if it's important uh, or something which is adding value to the routines which are there. Once you kind of show that it's adding value, then it's easier for them to see how can we work together and, and develop something and create something and implement something, an intervention which we kind of uh, help them in their that, uh, that okay. question over here first. Then I think Monica CD, you can try it. Who was first? <laughs> thank you. Uh, actually, uh, thank you for those presentation. I think it's it's very very interesting, and it's uh, it, I'm very pleased to see that we are looking a bit beyond digital and organization. But one thing that struck me, actually, we have conducted a similar project in some of the same countries, actually, in Western and Central Africa, in eight countries. And what uh, struck me in what you present is that it goes to the dashboard, which is one step. But nobody speaks about the step beyond the dashboard, which is actually to interpret the data, to look for the cause of what you see. You have the trends of the uh, of uh, I don't know whatever you you look at for example the vaccination. If for example you have a drop in the vaccination, then you have to ask your question why it's happening. So you you will look to another indicator or another source of data. For example, what about the antigen, the vaccines? Are there any problem in in you know? And uh, so what we did in our project, we made a, a sort of a procedure in three steps. Uh, in many countries, actually, the Global Fund was funding data validation uh, meetings. That's nice, but for those people who are actually providing the data, it's always providing data for somebody else. And so, and you check your data, and you check the quality, but not for yourself. So the idea was to actually transform those meetings into data review for the performance of what they are really doing. So nevertheless, the quality check is still a step that you need. If you analyze data in a research or whatever, the first thing that you do is to look at your data set and to clean it and to look at the quality of the data. So we kept the data verification, but it should be done normally before with all the tools that are normally in the HIS2 now, uh, in preparation of this meeting. The second step is the dashboard. It's to explore your data set with some key indicators that has been chosen uh, and to look at the trends. And the third step is to try to interpret and look for what the, this is going down or up and whatever and to try to identify some problems and solution. And then the whole meeting is uh, with some procedure to review what you have done before and step and, and again and again. So that's just a comment. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> uh, for those that uh, don't know Jean-Pierre Delamal, he's a, 
I would say, je ne sais pas comment on dit, le vieux de la vieille, is a, a senior in data, <laughs> in data and data world. Thank you for your comment. And yes, he pointed out the same thing as what we have uh, seen. It's lack of capacity in advanced data analysis, triangulating data and so on. So having the uh, data quality is one step and then exploring data in the second one with uh, dashboard and going beyond that why we uh, think to reach Tanzania. For example, in a country like uh, Sierra Leone, we are doing the whole bench. So we have the dashboard, for example, and then we have the BNA, the bo bottleneck analysis uh, application that we are implementing there. And that has been powered by East Tanzania and others. And then after that, we, you, you use the BNA to identify the root causes Uh, be it resources, be it practices, initial use, uh, sustaining the use, and then you go back. Uh, once you have identified the actions, you use the APT, the Action Planner and Tracker app, thing to reach Tanzania again, and then you can track the app, uh, the the uh, implementation of your recommendation. So yes, we are totally aligned. Thanks. Very quick because it's Monica, you know. So, uh, uh, I mean, um, sorry if I did not go into detail. So, in Sri Lanka, that what I meant by preparation is just that there are things that happen inside DHS too, and some certain things that happen outside. So, that preparation activity at sub district level includes just exactly what you mentioned. So, there will be reviewing, and of course, there will be feedback coming from district level. So, that's where so district is the focal point where we have all the capacity. So they will be reviewing active, uh, data of uh, sub-district level. Then there is a discussion before we have the formal district review meeting. Yeah, yeah um, thank you very much. And um, my question is uh, to Wilfred um, regarding the, the implementation that you've had in um, in in Tanzania, uh, because we are trying to really adapt this also in the education sector to have these districts of excellence. So what I'm interested really in knowing is um, like in your uh, use case, what exactly like, um, like when you did the assessment, what did you find, what was working and what did you do different beyond the technology? Because that wasn't really coming out in, um, in the, in the methodology that, that you shared. So maybe were there changes in data practices did you um what did you find gadgets there in terms of the dashboards you also talked about the health facility dashboards were this were these specific to um health facility indicators all these were part of the indicators like at the district level so those kind of like processes that changed and also yeah Very big question, actually. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. One, um, for a type of jump, I think, as I said, we actually have a, a report, the assessment report, which we kind of uh, identify all those issues which uh, we noticed at the state level and at district level, and what were the interventions which we kind of came together with the district and facility to see that okay, based on these gaps, uh, these are kind of the areas which we need to do. I think one of the key thing, uh, just to summarize, one of the key thing which we noticed that there was no standard way of doing that analysis. So uh, one facility could do, I mean, first of all, facilities are just more or less reporting. Uh, the data managers of the district were more or less kind of doing this ad hoc uh, analysis. There was no really kind of a structured way of doing this analysis. And I think that was kind of a, a big step in terms of us kind of say, as a district, what are your key indicators? We understand that there are kind of a, we call it a basket fund indicator, but that's really a reporting to the national level. But what really is your need at the district level to facility level? Once we kind of carve that out, we say that, okay, based on your need, these are the key indicators which you could need to kind of uh, follow up and then kind of come up with this uh, analytical framework, which now they're actually doing it in a monthly base to see that how can, what is the performance, how can we improve, and et cetera, et cetera. So I think those are kind of just an example, but there are so many things. For example, the fragmentation of our systems, and we hope as we digitalize the health facilities, we can kind of limit, you know, malaria uh, program not having their own digital system, the immunization have their own digital system. Just have one digital uh, tablet there where you can report different programs and then you kind of limit this fragmentation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just a heads up. Monica and I are still writing on the paper and we conduct our research everywhere, including this space. 
So um, I just want to uh, two points. One thing is thank you very much, Pamot and the team, for really emphasizing the social technical perspective. So I've always had the belief that the paper is not the problem. At least it's not the biggest problem. It has its limitations, but it's not the biggest problem as long as you have the information flow and the data is coming as it were. In the case of the Gambia, we also have a system that is so far doing what is required. The only problem is it, it in terms of um, access to it, it is only the national people that can do whatever they want to do. So we've been able to extend this with the help of the HIS, which has gracefully done this really well. And we've extended this to, you know, district level, regional level, and, you know, even down to some aspects in the school level. And uh, Monica and I have been working on a paper, and the paper tries to look at, you know, we have done all of these interventions. In the case of Uganda, they have almost given everything to the districts. In the case of Gambia, we try to do our best. But then, like um, uh, he says, uh, we have different ways of conceptualizing data use. And our adoption of data use, it starts from the noticing of the data itself. What pushes people to notice that, okay, we need to, you know, look at data to find, to find, if, to solve a problem or do this. So we have said, okay, DHI, so anytime you come and intervene, you know, you take care of the data quality part, the data collection part, of the presentation analysis. You have very, very nice dashboards. But how do the people notice those dashboards? How do they interpret those dashboards? And how do they plan their, their action? What do they do after, after, after immediately those dashboards are presented? And that is what our paper is trying to write about. And I'm very happy that this is coming into this discussion. And we are, hopefully, we would find answers to it. But at least one answer that we found is this, all the digitalization that we are doing is a really big enabler. But some of, at least one other, you know, factor that we've designed is the fact that some, you know, institutional factors, you know, like the social technical perspective, some people just to defend themselves from, you know, political biases would just go back. Okay, if the politician comes, I, I need to have my data available to defend my position. So these are some of the things that, you know, we are discovering and trying to find out from this paper. So thank you very much. Well, this is really emphasizing the, the, the focus on actually what's happening after uh, the capacity, analytical capacity. Super. I'm just going to be, I think this will be the last one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I think he tackled a little bit my, my, my point of concern. I was about to ask Pamud or Kofi when it comes to we really put a lot of effort collecting data, sensitizing people to to correct, to have a completeness, but at the end of the day, you find uh, the culture of using data is not there. So you find we, we, we say data is everything, evidence based, uh, whatever. But I just want to, your theory, did it uh, help you to understand the, fact that <laughs> what the institutional culture of using data is not there yet? Why maybe we are, we are busy supporting the ministries to correct data, have system by working system? Uh, so I just I didn't hear that, but then uh, mm -hmm. for 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 um, uh, my brother from Tanzania, it's about the we are trying to do the same for this uh, this sort of excellency in Rwanda, uh, but but, but uh, uh, like as a mentorship, but also as trying to understand to, to build that culture of data use, but uh, at the end of the day, you find it's not. It, Institutionalizing it, it's still an issue because like we won't be there every time. So, uh, does uh, your research or your or your experience uh, maybe <laughs> show up for some reasons, or, or maybe the best way we can maybe make it more institutionalized? Uh, I think we, we need to recruit uh, Adolf as a PhD candidate soon so that he can <laughs> enjoy these theories. Of course, it helps you a lot, and you have used a word, institutionalize. So. What we have seen is that we have a virtuous circle. Data use enforces data uh, quality, and data quality enforces data use, and it turns around. But how do you install this culture? This depends on the institutions that you have around the table, and then that way you start talking about who, what kind of institution you have around the table. The district, district management officer. What kind of uh, institution is that? What are the practices? What are the beliefs? And uh, the, uh, uh, um, uh, we were talking about how some people are uh, politically motivated. Uh, 
Some people are money driven. Some people are driven by their career. So what, or how all these interplays can be taken into account in a social technical design. So that's the reflection. And we have no answer. The journey is about reflecting about it. <laughs> I don't know if my senior can. <laughs> 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 no, just a, just a comment. I think the whole process of building or enhancing the culture of, um, of the process of data use, I think it's institutionalization of data use. I think we need to look at it from not only installing, but cultivating. And when you look at it from the cultivation perspective, it's kind of a long process where you really kind of uh, work with them, build with them, build the trust and also in, in, the, in the mentorship where they could actually take the lead in that in that hopefully they will take the lead in that particular process where they could really take it as their own and not really from Adolf or Wilfred. So I think that process of cultivating, it's not a one-time thing, it's a continuous thing. So the saga continues. Which is also a theoretical concept, actually, the cultivation. Ah. So to be continued. Thank you so much. We went 10 minutes into the lunch break. Thank you so much for this wonderful session, actually. And I hope we can continue the discussion on this very, very important matter.